All right, good afternoon. So I hope everyone is doing great. We will go ahead and start on uh, chapter 14 for today. Uh, so only the final three exams remain at this point. Uh, you have lecture exam number four, uh, comprehensive exam, and of course uh, your lab practical number four as well. Um, study guides were shared earlier. Hopefully you're using them. Um, and uh, the lecture quizzes, again, they are still there on uh, the Connect website. And I will be updating all of those grades um, after we reach the deadline at the end. All right, so with those reminders, let's go ahead and take a look uh, at a topic of discussion, which is the spinal cord. Uh, and as we mentioned before, uh, the spinal cord is the other part of your central nervous system other than the brain itself. <clears throat> and both of those actually arise out of, out of your ectoderm, right? So as you can see here, the spinal cord uh, is your link uh, between your brain and the rest of the body, okay? So even as a manner of speech, then when they say that the person showed quite some spine or he's, he showed no spine to the situation, um, that means like a, it's kind of like it's contained within the backbone, within the vertebral column. And so that's where all of those connotations come in, right? <clears throat> But basically, this is what the spinal cord does. It carries uh, sensations to the brain uh, and then from the brain to the effector organs. And the effector organs were, again, your glands and muscles, as you can see. Uh, then you have what are called spinal reflexes, as you see here. These ones never make their way up to your brain, such as your possibly the most famous reflex, which is your uh, knee jerk reflex or the patellar reflex, right? Uh, you tap the quadriceps tendon here, and the person kind of kicks forward. Uh, reflexively, this reflex never makes its way up to the brain. Right? This is a spinal reflex, right? Uh, so it's, it's fast. Uh, the fastest uh, knee-jerk reaction, literally, uh, it is contained and mediated within the spinal cord itself. All right, so here we are looking at uh, the human spinal cord all the way from the base of the brain, the brain stem, moving all the way down to your uh, sacral column over here, okay? We got uh, seven cervical vertebra there. We got 12 thoracic. We got five lumbar, five sacral, uh, and then the coccygeal region down here, okay? Now, some other structures that we can see here are things like uh, what is called the film terminale. Film terminale is this thin uh, projection of the pia mater. Remember, the pia mater was one of your three meninges, right? It, which still hangs like a tail at the end. That's what this is, okay? And then you have uh, what is called the cauda equina, which literally means a horse tail. Cauda equina, right? Horse tail, because there's your bunch of sacral nerves, which are kind of held together, like, like the tail of a horse. You can see it here in this picture as well. So in adults, the uh, Spinal cord comes to an end uh, at about, as we see here, um, <clears throat> at about L1, right? And the region there is called conus medullaris. So it's like a conical region uh, of your spinal cord, which ends at L1, all right? Uh, in addition to all of those, you also see these uh, plexuses. And a plexus, again, is an enlargement of nerves. You see a brachial plexus up here, not in this picture. Uh, then you have a sacral plexus, which forms here, and you kind of see it in this picture here, okay? All right, so next, uh, let's take a look <clears throat> at the spinal cord in a transverse section. Some things to notice, the white matter is on the outside here, and the gray matter is on the inside in the shape of the English letter H. You see it here, right? Uh, that's a central canal, that little hole in the middle, the central canal, okay? Um, now, here are two nerves which are attaching to the spinal cord. And as you can see, they have like a front arm or an anterior rootlet and a back arm, also called a posterior rootlet, as you can see. So the posterior rootlet contains your sensory nerves. All right. So the sensory axon, the sensory nerves make their way to your spinal cord via the posterior root here. The anterior one, the front one, carries the motor nerve fibers from the spinal cord to the rest of the body. Okay. So this is the input, uh, the sensory information from here into the spinal cord. And then this is the motor output from the spinal cord back to the rest of the body. And so what should be here in between the sensory and uh, motor neurons? Any idea? 
we mentioned that one before, the interneurons, right? The interneurons, they mediate between the posterior and, and the anterior rootlets, right? And here are examples of what kinds of sensations the sensory uh, po posterior root brings in, things like tactile receptors for touch, proprioceptors for your position of your joints, uh, also visceral, like um, stretch in your stomach and your other organs and chemoreceptors, all right? They all uh, feed their sensations via the posterior root. And then the anterior motor root sends out uh, signals to your skeletal muscles in the somatic system and also to your cardiac smooth muscle, the end glands, which is um, a visceral function. So what are the two primary functions of the spinal cord to take sensations from the sensory organs into the brain? and to take uh, commands from the brain back to the effector organs, right? What are the general shape, diameter, length of the spinal cord? It lasts, lasts all the way from the base of your brain to L1, okay? It's housed within the vertebral column. Uh, and the general shape, you just saw it, it in a trans, trans, it's cylindrical. What is the total number of spinal nerves? 31. How are they specifically identified? Well, based on what area of the spinal cord they're emerging from. How is the cauda equina formed from the sacral nerves kind of spreading out from the end of the spinal cord? What composes the cauda equina, your sacral nerves again? All right, so here, let's take a look at one of your backbone vertebrae here. It looks like your thoracic vertebra. So here it is, you have the transverse, uh, um, the spinous process, the transverse processes, right? There's the spinal cord, as you can see within the intervertebral foramen, you see him. And uh, here, the posterior rootlet, the anterior rootlet, you see all of them. Uh, and you can see that the spinal cord is held within the backbone by means of what is called the denticulate ligament. You see it here, denticulate ligament. It holds the spinal cord fast within the vertebral column, you see that. And then the three layers of meninges, dura mater, arachnoid mater, and then pia mater in all the spaces. So remember in the subarachnoid space here is where you will have the CSF or cerebrospinal fluid. Same thing, same picture. Here you see the spinal cord, um, the gray matter, the white matter there, right? Posterior rootlet, the anterior rootlet, uh, the three meninges surrounding it, um, dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. You see all three, and then the nerves uh, emerging from there. So lumbar puncture or the spinal tap is next. Uh, one procedure that I did quite frequently during my medical residency. Uh, so it is indicated for people who are suspected of having like meningitis or encephalitis, any infection of the central nervous system, people who have um, uh, pressure built into their central nervous system, uh, and you need to figure out what type of an infection is going on in their central nervous system, you will need a lumbar puncture there. So you ask the patient to lie in a knee to chest position, like in the fetal position, you put a drape or like a curtain, which is blue in color on their back uh, with a square cut in the middle, and you focus it on the uh, intervertebral space in between L3 and L4. That's where you uh, focus in between L3 and L4 in your backbone, right? And then you take this uh, big, mean looking 50 cc syringe, right? A needle, <clears throat> you insert it in between L3 and L4 vertebra, and then you hear a popping sound at some point, uh, which tells you that the needle has penetrated through the ligamentum flavum, which is over here, a tough ligament that holds all of the vertebra together, and that the needle is now in the subarachnoid space. Then you withdraw the cannula, and then some clear, ideally clear CSF starts to dribble out. Uh, but it's not always clear. Sometimes you can have a cloudy CSF, right? Or greenish color um, CSF, or it could even be bloody CSF with blood mixed in it, right? So what does that indicate? Uh, cloudy CSF could be infection, either meningitis or encephalitis, right? Some kind of a uh, central nervous system infection that is causing the proteins in the white blood cells to go up in your cerebrospinal fluid. So it assumes that cloudy coloration, all right? It could be uh, fungal, viral, bacterial, parasitic, many different causes. A bloody CSF, you could have like a hematoma, right? So it could be like a subdural uh, hematoma. It could even be a subarachnoid hematoma, any of those, right? So if you have active bleeding going on, 
in your spinal cord, well, that needs to be relieved uh, by means of a spinal tap as well, okay? Uh, and sometimes when you withdraw the cannula, the fluid will like shoot out at quite some pressure. So you should be wearing goggles ideally when you are uh, doing this procedure, okay? And, uh, and after you release this pressure, uh, most of the patients will uh, report either a reduction in headache or an increase in headache uh, after this, right? Because of the change in the fluid concentration, uh, you have sucked out the fluid. So they uh, feel this as pain, as pain in the head or headaches, something to remember. So where are the epidural, these spaces located? Epidural space on top of the dura mater, subdural space below the dura mater, sub means below, subarachnoid space below the arachnoid mater. Which one contains CSF? The subarachnoid space contains uh, CSF. All right, so here we are looking at another, another cross section of the spinal cord, only it's color coded for our convenience here. There's the posterior rootlet uh, and the anterior root. This carries sensory nerves. This one carries motor nerves. You can see all of those here. Uh, you also see that the uh, um, this part of the gray matter, the top of the letter H, that's the posterior horn. The posterior horn is where all of the sensations come in. The sensory receptors, or the sensory nerve feeds into the posterior horn. Then you have a lateral horn, which is on the side here, this one. Uh, and this contains your autonomic uh, nervous system motor neurons. Your autonomic nervous system is the one that is below your conscious level. It's your unconscious uh, part of the nervous system, which controls things like your heartbeat, your blood pressure, those kinds of things. And then finally, you have the anterior horn, which contains the uh, motor nucleus for motor actions, right? For actual movement. You see all of those structures here in this picture. All right. <clears throat> so uh, posterior funiculus is an area uh, on the posterior side of the spinal cord, such as here. Here's your posterior funiculus. And what you have here are the sensory tracts, all right? They bring in sensations. The lateral funiculus, they, contains both, they contain both sensory and motor tracts, all right? And then finally, the anterior funiculus, which carries, uh, contains, again, sensory and motor um, tracts, as we see here. <clears throat> so here, uh, it's again color-coded for you. You see different tracts. And remember, tracts are actually nerves that are running through your brain and your spinal cord. Once they're embedded in the spinal cord or nerves, at that point, they're called tracts or fasciculi, as you can see here. And they have different names. So. For example, here you have what is called the anterolateral pathway, the front and the side. Um, and what are some examples of tracts in that region? The lateral spinothalamic tract. Now look at the name. It goes from the spine to the thalamus of the brain, spinothalamic. So in other words, this is an ascending tract. It's rising up. It's going from the spine of the spinal cord all the way up to the thalamus of the brain. So this is an ascending tract. It brings in sensations. Uh, and also uh, anterior one. So anterior and lateral spinothalamic tracts, all right? What else? You have what here, the anterior corticospinal tract. Now this one is a descending tract. It's going down because it goes from the cortex of the brain to the spine or the spinal cord. So corticospinal tract, right? Then again, you have this orange one called the reticulospinal tract. Uh, it's going from the reticular system of the brain down to the, your spinal column, uh, spinal tract again spinal cord, right? And then this one is called the vestibular spinal tract. This one is coming from the vestibular region of the brain to the spinal cord and similarly with the tectospinal tract. So all those different names, all right? As you can see. Okay, so falling structures in order for relaying sensory input to the spinal cord. So where does it start? It starts from the sensory receptor first, like your skin, right? It picks up the sensations. Then they go to a uh, spinal nerve, the spinal nerve breaks up into the a posterior root and an anterior root, and then the posterior root uh, goes into the posterior horn. Okay, how about these structures for relaying motor output? So this was an ascending tract. This one is a descending tract. Um, so let's see what comes first, your uh, anterior horn, then the anterior root, then onwards into the spinal nerves, uh, and then onto your effector organs, including your skeletal muscle. Uh, the three types of funiculi, posterior, anterior, and lateral. List the specific tracts found in each. We just looked at the names in the previous slide. So we can go back and take a look at those. So we have two types of uh, spinal pathways, right? 
they are either sensory or they're motor. Sensory ones are ascending, moving up the spine, and the motor ones are descending, going down the spine, okay? All right, uh, also remember that most pathways decusate. Decusation means they cross over. Again, the right half of the brain controls the left side of the body and vice versa, contralateral. So they cross over, as you can see here, most of the pathways, right? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so what you're looking at in this picture is something called the uh, posterior uh, funiculus medial lemniscal pathway, posterior funiculus, right? So posterior means it's an ascending uh, pathway from the spinal cord up to the brain, all right? So how does it go? Well, here, let's follow along. In the spinal cord, uh, here's the anterior and the posterior root. The posterior root uh, climbs up here, right? And this uh, pathway carries your sensations of touch, pressure, and vibration, right? So they rise up here they reach your medulla oblongata. Uh, so here's the primary neuron. The primary neuron is found in your brain stem at the medulla oblongata. You can see it here. From here, it rises higher up into your midbrain, which is still your brain stem. And in the midbrain is where you have your secondary neuron, right? And then from the uh, midbrain, it rises further up to your thalamus, the post office of the brain, hopefully if you remember. And then from the post office of the brain to your somatosensory cortex, all right, to your sensory cortex here in the post-central gyrus. This is something we talked about yesterday. So three neurons, primary in the uh, medulla oblongata, then secondary neuron in the, in the what? In the pons, and then the tertiary neuron uh, within the brain, within the brain itself here. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look at this one. This is an anterolateral pathway of the spinal cord. So uh, this one carries what? Uh, your sensations of pain, temperature, crude touch, and pressure, all right? So again, uh, and it goes up into the anterior and the lateral spinothalamic tracts. They're carrying it together. So it goes through the medulla oblongata, right? Um, and uh, first up, here's the primary neuron within the spinal cord itself. The primary neuron is within the spinal cord for this one. The secondary neuron is in your pons. Here's the pons of your brain stem. Then it goes higher up through the midbrain and then goes to the thalamus, the post office of the brain. And then from here to the, onto the uh, somatosensory cortex. And you find the tertiary neuron here. Here's the tertiary neuron. So primary neuron in the spinal cord, secondary neuron in the brain stem and tertiary neuron within the brain itself. All right. Okay, second uh, up, uh, we are looking at the spinocerebellar pathway. Looking at the name, you can tell me where, where to where is it going. It's growing, going from your spinal cord up to your cerebellum, therefore the name, spinocerebellar pathway, as you see. Let's uh, track along the pathway of this one, right? So first up here is the primary neuron or within the spinal cord. Uh, it rises up and it carries uh, your sense of position as regards your joints, muscles, and tendons. That's what this one does, the spinocerebellar pathway. Remember, the cerebellum is about muscle memory. So primary uh, neuron is here in the, in the what? In the spinal cord, then rises up through the medulla oblongata. Uh, here you have the secondary neuron in between the brain and the uh, brain stem. And then from here, it go, moves on to your cerebellum. So not the tertiary neuron here, only primary and secondary neurons, and then the cerebellum. All right, so here we are looking at uh, motor pathways now. So motor pathways are descending. They go from top to bottom. Sensory pathways from bottom up, right? So this is going in the opposite direction. So let's follow along here. So it starts in your precentral gyrus because that is your motor cortex. If you remember the motor homunculus that we talked about before, it moves all the way down. Uh, in the brain, it makes up what is called the upper motor neuron. So here's the upper motor neuron. Then it goes down into your brain stem, like the midbrain here. Uh, this is a corticospinal tract again, both anterior and lateral. Then it moves down to your medulla oblongata, where it switches sides, okay? Uh, right side to the left, left side to the right. They cross over, and then it goes down to the spinal cord, and then from the spinal cord to your skeletal muscle by means of a lower motor neuron. So the upper motor neuron is here. 
in the structure of the brain itself, the lower motor neuron is here uh, in between the spinal cord and the muscle. So at this point, uh, let's, well, actually, let me see. So these ones are called indirect pathways, right? Uh, because here the upper motor neuron, um, upper motor neurons originate in your brain stem, and then from that point onwards, they take a complicated route to spinal cord. All right. So, um, and these are examples of those indirect motor pathways: reticulospinal tract uh, from the reticular formation down to the spine, tectospinal tract from the superior and inferior colliculus, and their function is to um, uh, to visually track things for you or auditorily track them. Right, so how you visually track a moving object or turn to the side where you hear a so noise from, uh, that's the function of the tectospinal tract. The reticulospinal tract controls reflexes related to posture and balance. And then the vestibulospinal tract is useful during sitting, standing and walking your muscle tone, okay? All right. So, uh, right, so I was talking about the upper versus motor neurons, okay? As we see here in these, uh, in this picture. So one of the major things that you will have to do as a neurologist working in the neurology ward is to assess a patient for either upper motor neuron injury or lower motor neuron injury. Now that by no means means that you will get like clear cut upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron injury pictures. Sometimes you get a mixed picture, it's quite common, right? However, there are certain generalizations that we can apply here. First up, uh, the upper motor neuron lesion, right? So what will you see in a patient on examination in someone who is suffering from an upper motor neuron lesion, okay? So first up, what you will see in someone with upper motor neuron lesion uh, is something called uh, spastic paralysis. And I'll explain what that is in a minute here. And then the uh, other thing you will see here is uh, hyperreflexia. Hyperreflexia, okay? All right, reflexia. So let's talk about what each of these terms actually mean, all right? Uh, spastic paralysis. This means even though the patient is paralyzed on one side, but the muscles are still contracted. It's, para it's paralysis, the person cannot move or hold on to anything, but it's spastic. If you feel the muscles, they're very tight. This can happen uh, in, in many different types of strokes, which is a type of upper motor neuron lesion, right? The second thing you see here is hyperreflexia, which means that the re reflexes are uh, brisk, exaggerated reflexes. For example, if you check the knee jerk reflex in this patient, you just hit it gently with the hammer and the patient kicks you in the face because the reflex is so brisk. Uh, that would be what hyperreflexia is about, okay? So how does that can compare with the lower motor neuron lesion picture? Here you get what is called uh, flaccid paralysis, number one. Okay, flaccid paralysis. Number two, um, hypo or uh, areflexia, which means either a lack of reflexes completely or weak reflexes. So in this patients, those with lower motor neuro neuron lesions, when you do like a um, knee jerk reflex, a patellar tap, uh, barely anything happens, no reflexes or very, very diminished reflexes, all right? And they have flaccid paralysis, which means not only are they paralyzed, but there's no muscle tone, flaccid, flaccid paralysis versus spastic paralysis, okay? So that, that is a clinical distinction in between the two. But like I said, most of the diseases have a mixed picture. But even so, let's talk about some of the uh, common conditions that can give you upper motor neuron lesions affecting the brain. Think of all of the brain disorders like stroke, number one, right? Uh, number two, Alzheimer's, right? What else? Parkinson's. All right, affects the brain. Uh, Huntington's disease, another one. Okay, what else? Uh, cerebral palsy in the brain. Cerebral palsy, palsy here. There you go. So all examples of upper motor neuron or brain trauma, right? A brain hemorrhage because of a blow to the head or something. Okay, so then how about some examples of lower motor neuron lesions? They have to do with problems with your spinal cord and your actual muscles. So things like, uh, muscular dystrophy, right? That's a lower motor neuron lesion, muscular dystrophy. What else? An infectious disease called polio. In polio, uh, the nerves supplying your muscles are destroyed, your lower motor neuron, 
uh, neurons are destroyed here. So polio, another example of a lower motor neuron lesion, right? What else? Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome or GBS. We talked about that one yesterday, if you remember, right? Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, again, lower motor neuron lesion. What else? Myasthenia gravis, lower motor neuron lesion, okay? Uh, so just based on your physical neurological exam, you can think a lot, start thinking along all of those conditions. Is this an upper motor neuron problem or a lower motor neuron problem? And then uh, you can potentially look at the list of diseases in each and try to figure out uh, which one is it, all right? Okay, treating spinal cord injury. So real case, when I was working as, my, uh, as a first year resident in, at that hospital in Chicago, uh, so one day, this uh, construction worker was wheeled into the ER. He was a young guy, I would say, in his early 30s, uh, good health. So he was working uh, on construction on a building in downtown Chicago, and he was suspended. He was working on the 10th story. He was, he was wearing his harness and uh, all of the saddle and everything. Uh, but somehow, because of some technological problem or whatever, his harness came undone. He lost balance and he fell. He took a fall from the 10th story down Chicago downtown, and he landed feet first, right? Pretty bad. Seemed like he had fractured his vertebrae, like his backbone, right? So uh, when so he was stabilized in the ER. I was put on an IV, uh, normal saline, just to prevent dehydration, right? Uh, and one thing that was, uh, of course, given painkillers, he was in a lot of pain because of the uh, spinal fractures. But one thing that also became apparent, he could not urinate or defecate because both of those are spinal reflexes right? In order to urinate, you need your spine to work properly. It's a spinal reflex to defecate, to relax your urinary or your, uh, or your uh, rectal sphincters, anal sphincters rather, you need an intact spinal cord, which he didn't. So what did we have to do? We had to put in a Foley's catheter into him uh, so we can drain out the urine. So a catheter had to be put in, a Foley's catheter. So Let's uh, take quick notes here. Uh, construction worker in Chicago. So he went into what is called a spinal concussion or shock, spinal shock. Spinal concussion or spinal shock. What was his treatment? IV hydration, right? Uh, IV painkillers, he was put on morphine, IV painkillers, or what is called analgesia painkilling, analgesia. And he was also uh, subjected to a Foley's catheter insertion. One of my least favorite uh, medical procedures, by the way, least favorite. I almost always invariably tried to give it to some other resident. I just didn't like doing it. Least favorite procedure of mine, right? Uh, so what were my most favorite? You might be wondering. We talk about uh, those two. My most favorite ones were uh, inserting a, a nasogastric tube, inserting a nasogastric or NG tube. I enjoyed doing that because it was in the upper end and not the lower end, uh, and also drawing blood. Kind of enjoyed that too, drawing blood. Oh, and also doing a FNAC for fine needle aspiration cytology, where you put a needle into the thyroid gland and you suck out cells and send them for pathological analysis, okay? Anyway, so this patient, uh, yes, uh, he was worried about all, all of this, and but we had to uh, reassure him. So how did we solve his issues? Well, uh, for his lack of urination, we put in a Foley's catheter so we could collect the urine in a urine bag. What did we do for the constipation? He couldn't defecate either. We uh, basically gave him, gave him a saline enemas. Enemas is where you uh, wash out the rectum with the salt water just to clean, clean out the fecal matter. Uh, since he could not defecate on his own, all right? So that was our management. Uh, and he continued to improve, right? So then he was discharged when he was able to, uh, and then physical therapy was on the case. He had to kind of relearn how to walk and everything, right? Uh, spinal concussion, your lower legs were paralyzed too. Uh, and so after he was discharged, he came back uh, a few weeks later, uh, not to the ER, but to the OPD, to the outpatient department. And now his complaint was uh, not any of those from before, uh, but now he was complaining of erectile dysfunction. He couldn't um, successfully have a sexual 
uh, have uh, sexual relationships with his partner, right? And he was concerned about that. So then we had to, instead of like just prescribing Viagra or doing something like that, we had to explain to him that this is very normal in people who have suffered spinal concussion because again, erection, ejaculation, these are all spinal reflexes too. So a broken spine, it's very normal for people to lose this function. And we had to reassure him that with time, gradually he's gonna re regain his uh, erectile function and ejaculation, just like his uh, urination and defecation came back. And sure enough, um, after we saw him again in the OPD and things were improving for him, let's, let's just put it that way, all right? Okay, so uh, he was also given antibiotics. That's true, antibiotics. And the one that he was put on, I still remember, is uh, an antibiotic called Zosin. I think we talked about that before as well. Very widely used in a hospital setting, uh, which is piperacillin, a type of penicillin, and clavulanic acid. That's Zosin. So why put him on antibiotics? Because he had all of these things stuck in him. Uh, the IV line, the urinary catheter. So he was prone to infections, right? right? Anytime you insert anything in the human body, there's always a risk for microorganisms to gain entry and do that. So something you have to remember. Uh, also, steroids uh, could be used here because steroids uh, prevent swelling and inflammation after spinal cord injuries, okay? Uh, and this is something that also happened to uh, the famous uh, star from the 70s and 80s, uh, Christopher Reeve, uh, better known as Superman. Uh, in movies, right? The original Superman, uh, Christopher Reeve. So he also suffered a fall uh, uh, in a der uh, derby accident, right? Horse racing. Uh, and he, unfortunately, he lost control of all four of his, of his limbs, something called quadriplegia. And so he died because of complications resulting from it. He had like a serious lung infection following that. And now you can also use stem cells to repair your uh, spine, right? Stem cells that regrow your spinal cord for that matter. Uh, what characteristics are common to most conduction pathways? Uh, they're ascending or descending, sensory or motor, and they carry, uh, contain neurons, like for sensory ones, primary, secondary, tertiary neurons, for the motor ones, upper motor and lower motor neurons. Okay, so we talked about that. Primary neurons are found in the spinal cord itself. Secondary neurons are found in the brain stem, Tertiary neurons are found in your brain, in the thalamus. What type of information does the posterior funiculus pathway transmit? Um, your position of your joints, something call, called proprioception, right? Locations and functions of upper and lower motor neurons, we talked about it, upper motor neurons in the brain, lower motor neurons in your spinal cord or in actually in between the muscle and the uh, nerve. Differences between direct and indirect pathways, direct pathways pass directly down, uh, through the neurons to your other regions, indirect pathways take some alternative routes, okay? So here you're looking at uh, what are called the posterior, uh, like as we see here, uh, and anterior ramus, branches of nerves. So the posterior ramus, these nerves uh, is, supply uh, the muscles and skin of the back. They're, therefore, they're called posterior in the back. The anterior ones, uh, they supply the uh, uh, front, the anterior and the lateral part of the trunk and the upper and the lower limb, as you can see, okay? Then you have these uh, little fibers called the rami communicantes, which are small branches of autonomic fibers, right? And these autonomic fibers control your bodily uh, visceral functions like blood pressure, breathing rate, all of those things. So here in this picture, you can see the rami, the posterior ramus, supplying the muscles and the skin of the back and the anterior ramus uh, supplying the anterior part of the trunk, right? All right, dermatomes. So I, I believe you talked about this earlier, right? Dermatomes are uh, regions on the surface of your skin that represent uh, internal organs. For example, if you get appendicitis, the pain of appendicitis, where is the appendix located? First of all, it's located right about excuse me, uh, here, okay, right lower quadrant. But why do you feel the pain of acute appendicitis? Right about here, T10, around your umbilicus. Anyone who has suffered from an acute appendicitis attack will testify to the fact that the pain starts out here and then becomes gradually worse with nausea and vomiting and fever, and then slowly it migrates down here. This is called referred pain. Why this? Because the nerves, 
supplying the appendix down here also send skin branches or cutaneous branches of nerves to this area. So you feel the pain on the surface of the skin quite some distance away from the actual organ that is causing the pain. Another example of referred pain, a heart attack, myocardial infarction. Where's your heart? Right about here, right? Left uh, mediastinum. Where do you feel the pain? It radiates all the way up to your jaw, down your left arm, sometimes all, all, all the way to your left back uh, as well, right? So why radiation? Because the same nerves that supply the heart, like the T3, T4, T5, also send skin or cutaneous branches to the arm, as you can see here. So this is where you will feel the pain of the uh, pain of heart attack or myocardial infarction. If you have a stone in your urinary bladder, you feel the pain right here in between the buttocks in the back. It's your urinary bladder. So that's where the dermatomes come in handy, right? Uh, so referred pain uh, and dermatomes, two things to remember. All right, shingles uh, is uh, caused by the chicken pox virus, which is, which is called VZV for varicella zoster virus, right? VZV, so we'll write it down here. Uh, chicken pox virus or varicella zoster virus, okay? Which gives you this disease. Most people have had it as kids, as children. Some of them don't remember having it, but they do have it. The thing about viruses, and especially these uh, uh, zoster, uh, varicella zoster viruses, is they like to hide in your body. So you never really get rid of them. Even when you recover from chickenpox, those viruses, they're still there, but they're hiding in your posterior rootlets um, of the nerves, right? And so sometime in the future, when you are under stress or malnourished or undergoing steroid treatment, whatever condition become infected with HIV uh, or not getting enough sleep, uh, when your immune system is depressed, this chicken pox causing very cell zoster virus gets reactivated. So it migrates down your uh, sensory nerves again and causes localized rashes. So this is like mini chicken pox, right? Uh, it could be painful and itchy, uh, but it's not quite as serious as full blown uh, full-blown chicken pox. So you don't get it twice. Once you have had chicken pox, then you get shingles, as you can see. So you can use some uh, medications, antivirals, to reduce the severity of the signs and symptoms. Uh, most commonly used ones are like Zovirax, which is the brand name for an antiviral called the Cyclovir. It's commonly used, right? Uh, so that can reduce the severity of the disease. All right, so next up, we are looking at uh, nerve plexuses. Plexus means uh, a network, all right? And the first one, that network of nerves that we, we will take a look at here is something called the cervical plexus. The cervical plexus, again, comes from the word cervix, which is for the neck. It's formed by the anterior rami or anterior branches of C1 to C4, right? The first four cervical vertebrae, as you can see here. And uh, they basically supply your neck muscles of the anterior region, skin of the neck, as well as head and shoulders, portions of him. Um, the most important nerve from here is the phrenic nerve, which comes from C3 to C5, all right? Uh, and the thing to remember about phrenic nerve is, remember how we were talking about death by hanging or by a whiplash? If you get a really serious whiplash, right? Whiplash injury. What that can do is, that can actually cause a severing or cutting out of the uh, phrenic nerve because severing of the phrenic nerve, because the phrenic nerve originates in your neck. So any trauma there can actually cause it to be severed. And that result, and what is the phrenic nerve supply? Your diaphragm, phrenic means diaphragm, which means um, instant death because you stop breathing. Uh, so I'll, that is a, always a danger with these kinds of injuries, okay? So here you're looking at the cervical plexus. Plexus is this network of nerves that you see here in this picture, okay? So then comes the brachial plexus. And the, what we have to remember about the brachial plexus is the five terminal branches, the five main branches from here, which are these axillary nerve, median nerve, musculocutaneous, radial nerve, and then the ulnar nerve. Let's talk about their supply. The axillary nerve supplies your shoulder muscle, like your deltoid, as you can see, all right? And also the sensations from here. The median nerve, that's your carpal tunnel nerve. So that supplies sensations to the palms of the hand as you can see, right? Also the anterior forearm muscles here, thin arm muscles at the base of the thumb, as we mentioned before, okay? 
Uh, then the musculocutaneous nerve that supplies your biceps brachii, that's its most well-known function, okay? And also some sensations from the lateral forearm over here. Radial nerve, again, supplies the radial side of the arm and also your palm, the, the uh, two-thirds, the, the lateral two-thirds of the palm here, okay? Um, Or uh, also then uh, when we move on to the ulnar nerve and then the ulnar nerve supplies branches here to the medial one third, the medial one third of your hand over here, the sensory input from here, okay? As well as your intrinsic hand muscles. All right, now that we know the in here in this picture, you can look at these branches, the median nerve, musculocutaneous nerve, axillary, radial nerve, and the ulnar nerve here. They're all visible, all right? More so here. And again, look at those nerves here in this picture. So let's talk about brachial plexus injuries. First up, who's more prone to getting those people who work on anything with their arms extended like this. Um, and so any blow to the arm from here, if you fall on something uh, with your arm uh, outstretched and you land on a like a sharp object or a, even a blunt object with some force that can cause injury to your brachial plexus. If you're a wrestler, somebody twisted your arm all the way back there or back here, uh, or even a like a baseball player, right? Uh, chucking the ball every time, that can also result in brachial plexus injuries. So uh, what would those injuries look like though? So let's talk about your axillary nerve first. The axillary nerve injury, since your deltoid muscle is paralyzed here, you cannot extend or ab abduct your arm beyond 90 degrees. This is as far as you will go. Weakness of the shoulder with the axillary nerve. Radial nerve injury, it will cause wrist drop. Your hand will, you won't be able to extend your wrist. No extension or hyperextension of the wrist possible. Wrist drop, all right? That's what it's called. So uh, radial nerve injury results in a wrist drop, right? Uh, Median nerve injury, we know that one all too well. Carpal tunnel syndrome, pins and needles sensation, weakness of the thenar muscles here, right? Uh, the classical case. Uh, then ulnar nerve injury, such as if you hit your funny bone too hard, which might actually sever the ulnar nerve, you develop a claw hand like this. Your intrinsic muscles are paralyzed and your, your hand becomes contracted, permanently contracted like this, all right? Claw hand for ulnar nerve injuries, so. All our nerve injuries. Claw hand here. All right. So now we are down to the uh, lumbar plexus. And the lumbar plexus, as you can see, emerges from your lumbar uh, spinal cord, right? From L1 to L5, as you can see here. And these are some of the nerves. The femoral nerve, that's the biggest one. The major nerve from the lumbar plexus is the femoral nerve. Um, then the obturator nerve as you see here as well, right? Uh, and then some of the smaller branches. And the names tell you the area that they supply. So iliohypogastric nerve supplies your ilium and the hypogastric region, Sim similarly here, right? Genitofemoral nerve, genital area, uh, and the femoral area, the front of the thigh. Okay, sacral plexus, moving further down, it's formed by the anterior rami of L4 to S4. And this has the largest nerve in the human body, which is your, uh, sciatic nerve, there it is. The sciatic nerve has two divisions then, right? A common fibular division and a tibial division. Tibial division goes anteriorly and medially, fibular division goes laterally in the lower leg. So here's your sciatic nerve. So when you get the pain of sciatica, lower back pain, right? It's basically the sciatic nerve that is being pinched there. And then of course the pudendal nerve that supplies your genital area as well, all right? Sciatica, that's what I was talking about. So people who lift like heavy weights or my patient, the one who fell uh, you know, straight down from the 10th story, landed on his feet, uh, people like him, they can uh, develop uh, disc herniation, right? So the disc protrudes in between the two vertebrae and it may pinch uh, the sciatic nerve. Treatment, bed rest, uh, ice application, right? And gradual exercises, try to like uh, bicycle your way in the air, right? So that is gradually going to build strength in your back muscles. Uh, and that tends to relieve the pain of sciatica later on as well. Uh, common fibular nerve injury, if you get hit from the side on your, uh, just uh, lateral to your knee, okay? Or 
so fracture of the fibula itself, or if your cast is too tight, they, that can do it, do that as well. In any case, you're unable to lift your foot up. You cannot dor dorsiflex your foot and you cannot evert the foot out. You lose these two abilities here. So differences between anterior and the posterior ramus, the anterior ramus supplies the front uh, skin and the front torso, the posterior ramus supplies the skin and the muscles of the back torso. What is a dermatome? Uh, an area of the skin that is supplied by a nerve that also sends branches to some deeper organs. It may be clinically significant because of referred pain, pain of your appendicitis, you feel it around your umbilicus, heart attack pain and all those things. Composition of a typical nerve plexus, uh, you have a bunch of uh, spinal nerves that come together to give off branches to supply your upper or lower limbs. Uh, what do the intercostal nerves innervate? Look at the name intercostal nerves, the muscles in between the ribs or the intercostal muscles. The action of the phrenic nerve, it supplies your diaphragm, helps you breathe. What spinal nerves typically compose the brachial plexus? Um, what ones, which ones were those from C, uh, C5 to, uh, to T1, okay? Which nerve might you have damaged if you have difficulty abducting your arm? Uh, axillary nerve. How do the ulnar nerve and radial nerve compare with respect to motor and cutaneous innervation? Uh, the ulnar nerve supplies the medial half of the arm and the hand. The radial nerve supplies the lateral ha half of the arm and the hand. Uh, which nerve of the lumbar plexus might you have damaged if you have difficulty extending your knee, the femoral nerve? What anterior rami form the sacral nerve plexus, S1 to S4? And what Gen, let's see, in what general areas of the body does it uh, innervate? Your genital area and also the, uh, the inguinal area, area, okay? And the front of the thigh as well. Okay, so finally here we are talking about reflexes. What is a reflex? It's a rapid pre-programmed involuntary response, something that you do not learn. Uh, most reflexes are not learned. They are there by birth, right? It's a survival mechanism because uh, it helps you mostly uh, move away from danger or from a noxious, painful stimulus, right? Uh, it's involuntary, right? So it happens by itself. That's why it's called a reflex. It's rapid, it's pre-programmed. We talked about all of those things, okay? And uh, there, it's a response to a stimulus. So for example, this one, right? So this guy was poked with a sharp needle here, as you can see in the picture. Um, so also what we are seeing here is the reflex arc, okay, which is five uh, different components to it. What are those? First step, uh, the guy poked with a needle, as I was saying, um, that's the stimulus, right? That's, that's number one. So the stimulus is carried by your sensory nerve, which is number two, nerve signal is propagated uh, through the posterior route, and then it goes to the, um, it's relayed onto your interneuron in purple. This is number three, right? The interneuron processes this information, and then uh, the interneuron sends some nerve branches to the brain. The brain processes this information real quickly and sends uh, some instructions back through the interneuron, which is communicated to the motor neuron here, right? This is step number four. The motor neuron carries those signals. And then finally, step number five uh, is when your muscles or your effector organ, that is, it reacts and you move your hand away from this painful stimulus, all right? So five components. Um, the stimulus on the sensory receptor, um, the sensation through the sensory neuron, then to onto the motor neuron, which, uh, not motor neuron, but the interneuron, which processes this information. Then the interneuron sends information to the uh, motor neuron, which carries it to the effector organ, which is usually a muscle, all right? So when you're looking at reflexes, you are trying to answer these five questions. Is the reflex spinal or cranial? Does it go to the spine and right back or does it travel all the way up to the brain, okay? Is it somatic or visceral? Somatic like your knee jerk reflex where you use your actual uh, muscles. Visceral reflex is something which is subconscious like when your heart speeds up when you see an exciting scene. That is a visceral reflex or your blood pressure shoots up. That's a visceral reflex. Monosynaptic or polysynaptic? Does it have only one synapse on its way or multiple synapses? Uh, the only truly monosynaptic reflex is your knee jerk reflex, the patellar reflex, all right? Uh, so which means that your sensory neuron synapses directly with the motor neuron. There is no intermediate uh, inner neuron uh, involved here. Is it ipsilateral or contralateral? Does the 
reflex take place on the same side as the stimulus or is it the opposite side? Innate or acquired, were you born with this reflex or did you learn this reflex later on? Like I talked about the sucking and the rooting reflex, we are born with it, right? You touch the corner of the mouth of the baby and then instinctively start sucking on it. So, all right, here is an example of uh, a monosynaptic reflex, direct communication between sensory and motor neurons. So you hit the quadriceps tendon and this, uh, uh, stimulus is taken by the sensory nerve to your directly to your motor neuron, which reacts right away, and you kick in the front. There you go. Polysynaptic reflex, uh, you burn your hand. This goes by the sensory nerve to the interneuron. The interneuron sends it to the brain quickly. The brain processes it, brings it back. Then onto the motor neuron, finally, you move your hand away. So interestingly, this actually is a much longer polysynaptic reflex than the uh, monosynaptic reflex here, okay? So uh, speaking of spinal reflexes, there are four common types of spinal reflexes, okay? Uh, what are those? A stretch reflex, a Golgi tendon reflex, withdrawal reflex, and then the crossed extensor reflex, all right? So uh, let's start with the stretch reflex. For example, in a muscle, right? When a muscle is overstretched, it reacts by overcontracting. Simple as that, that's the stretch reflex. So when you hit your uh, quadriceps tendon of the knee, it's kind of like stretching it. It responds by contracting and your uh, leg kicks forward, okay? So that's simple, that's a stretch reflex. When you overstretch a muscle, it responds by over contracting, okay? All right, so like it says, when stretched, uh, spindle sensory axon fires uh, impulses that are conducting, conducted to the spinal cord, the sp in spinal cord, uh, the sensory axon excites alpha motor neurons of the same muscle causing contraction. It's a monosynaptic re uh, reflex. And simultaneously, the sensory axon excites inner neurons that inhibit motor neurons of antagonist muscle. So there you go, okay? So there, that's a stretch reflex. When a muscle is overstretched, it responds by overcontracting. Golgi tendon reflex is the opposite in the sense that it prevents your muscles from uh, excessive contracting, okay? Uh, so you don't want to overstretch your muscles, but you don't want to overcontract them either. So that's what they do. So Golgi tendon organs, they detect excessive tension, okay? So what that does is it causes the muscles to relax, uh, preventing it from further damage, okay? So here are the steps of a Golgi tendon reflex, right? Uh, you move your uh, leg up, you move your leg away uh, so that when you move it up, this muscle is contracting your quadriceps, but your hamstrings are relaxed, all right? The Golgi tendon reflex. And so then you have the withdrawal reflex. Um, and one example of withdrawal reflex is something called the crossed extensor reflex. So what happens here? Look at this person. This person puts his foot uh, on a hot object or a painful object or whatever. Instinctively, well, this is carried by the sensory nerve onto the spinal cord through the in, inner neuron, then the interneuron sends messages of the motor neuron. How does the person react? Uh, he contracts the uh, quadriceps muscle of this leg, therefore uh, removing uh, the leg from the painful stimulus. But at the same time, he shifts automatically his weight uh, all onto the uh, corresponding leg on the other leg, right? So these quadriceps are contracting to move the leg away from the painful stimulus, but the quadriceps on the other leg are actually relaxing, okay? To, to uh, take the weight of the body on that side. So that's what the crossed extensor reflex is. Um, for example, as left leg is withdrawn, right leg's quadriceps is excited, allows the opposite side limb to support body weight while the hurt limb withdraws. So we talked about those. If you have hypoactive reflexes, think what? Uh, lower motor neuron lesions like spinal cord damage, polio, uh, muscular dystrophy, those kinds of things. Hyperactive reflex, think upper motor neurons like Parkinson's disease, stroke. Um, what else did we talk about? Alzheimer's, uh, Huntington's disease, multiple, well, multiple sclerosis has both hyperactive and hypoactive, both upper and more and lower. Um, motor neuron lesion, so it's a mixed one. So what are the four main properties of a reflex? It is pre-programmed, it is uh, instinctive, it is not learned, uh, it is rapid, and uh, yes, those four. The five steps of a reflex arc, first you get a stimulus, 
the sensory neuron carries it to the spinal cord. Step number two, step number three, the interneuron communicates that with your motor neuron. Uh, then the motor neuron carries it to your effector organs, that's step number four. And then the effector organs, usually your muscles react, and that is step number five. How are somatic reflexes and visceral reflexes distinguished? Somatic reflexes uh, are uh, reflexes of your skeletal muscles, like your knee jerk reflex. Visceral reflexes are internal organs, like your heart speeding up or your blood pressure shooting up. Major difference between monosynaptic and polysynaptic reflexes and monosynaptic reflexes, there is no interneuron, just from sensory neuron directly onto the motor neuron. In polysynaptic reflexes, there are interneurons uh, involved as well. Co for common spinal reflexes, they were Golgi tendon reflex, stretched reflex, withdrawal reflex, uh, cross extensor reflex. Uh, identify the Golgi tendon reflex, which is an innate reflex as spinal or cranial, it's spinal. Is it somatic or visceral? It is somatic, it affects your skeletal muscles. Is it monosynaptic or is it uh, polysynaptic? It is polysynaptic, there's a, an inner neuron there. And ipsilateral or contralateral, it's ipsilateral on the same side. What problems could a hypoactive reflex suggest? Lower motor neuron lesions or problems like, again, polio, uh, botulism, muscular dystrophy, right? Uh, spinal cord injuries. Okay, so finally, we are looking at the uh, formation of the backbone of the, of the spinal cord during the embryonic period, week four, to week six, right? And then onwards uh, from week six, six to week nine is when your spinal cord is forming here. Um, the LR plates and the basal plates, as you can see here, right? Um, the LR plates, they develop into the posterior structures like the posterior horns and the posterior gray commissure. Um, the basal plates, they develop into the anterior and lateral horns. So from the LR plates, uh, the anterior, uh, the posterior horns from the basal plates, the anterior horns develop. All right, so there it is. We are done with chapter 14 as well. So I will be uh, sending out the notes and lecture to you guys. Tomorrow I shall be recording uh, lecture for chapter number 15. So that way we only have 16 left for next week and then exams all the way. All right, so have a wonderful rest of the session and evening. Take care and I'll basically be sharing stuff with you uh, again tomorrow. Bye-bye.